Um, I would say in terms of uh, like thinking about history and historical facts, I would probably say my family is the biggest influence. And action. Uh, my name is Caitlin Greenidge. I was born in Boston, Massachusetts in 1981. Um, and I did my undergrad at Wesley University. Graduated in 2004 with a major in US history and a concentration in African American history. Um, and I went to Hunter College uh, for my MFA in fiction writing. And I graduated in 2010. Um, and I work as a research associate at Weeksville Heritage Center in Brooklyn, New York, and I worked here for six years. History is always really important to our family. Um, my grandfather um, was a Prince Hall Mason, which is a kind of like a black social organization. Um, and he worked really hard for many years to set up a uh, proper like burial ground and memorial for um, black veterans of the Revolutionary War in our town. Um, and our town is, we, were, we lived in basically, um, it was a mostly all white town. It was us and one other black family who were really close friends who lived there. So it was kind of a really big uh, historical deal to set up this cemetery and um, memorial for black revolutionary war veterans. But the way that my grandfather talked about it was um, just kind of really quiet um, way of talking about it. Um, and I don't know, it's, it's just kind of moments like that that really got into me that history is something that you live every day um, and that is kind of always present with you, um, that is constantly influencing what you do with your life, but to, an, in another way, also isn't something that should kind of choke you or hold you back. It should be something that, um, you know, helps you create new things in the world. So. In, in high school, we moved to um, Davis Square, and that was like, if you look at it now, it looks like Brooklyn, but that was considered like the big bad city when we moved there. Um, and, uh, but I really was able to take that neighborhood as my own and feel really comfortable there um, and eventually really love living there. It's weird because we were living there at a time in Davis Square when um, the neighborhood was basically gentrifying. So literally, like I think we moved there when I was a freshman in high school. And when we moved there, um, nobody in my class and none of my friends from before would come to my house to hang out because it was considered like, you know, people call Summerville like Scummerville or Slummerville or they just hated it. And then like within four years, by the end of living there, it was, you know, the hot place to be. And then four years after that, when I graduated from college, all of a sudden all these kids who made fun of me for living there are, you know, like getting apartments there and driving up the rents and all that kind of stuff. So that was like a really early introduction to kind of change over time and historical change over time that was unexpected, but I'm glad that I kind of got to see that on the ground floor and see how that works. So. Excuse me, 1930s Weeksville. Um, so this whole neighborhood, in 1930 was getting ready for another um, really huge change which was the building of um, Kingsborough Housing Project. So Kingsborough Housing Project is the housing project um, directly So much the stuff from has gone online in the last couple of years and so much stuff relating to kind of more obscure archives is just, I mean, I couldn't do my job without having access like that, without having free access like that. Um, and I'm conflicted about it because I do think that um, you know, there's a value to the documents and a context to the documents that gets completely lost when, you know, they're just available and um, kind of out there. But then another part of me kind of just feels like, you know, there's no reason, there's no actual real reason why they shouldn't be made accessible and that the value and context is really up to you to create. That if the value and context depends on them being locked away or depends on them, you know, having this um, kind of storied feel to them, then you know, you're kind of, then they're not really valued. They have to kind of live out in the world. So it's like, it's something that I kind of go back and forth about it. Like I feel kind of ambivalent about the fact that stuff is so free, but I am happy that it is that way because it makes my job a lot easier, so. <laughs> Reading or, or being so steeped in African-American history, so much of the tropes and narrative and just way people think about it is, is a completely kind of negative thing. 
Um, and every, a lot of the figures that you look at have really kind of tragic and violent ends or especially if it's someone in the arts, it's like, and they died penniless and alone and you're like, oh God, like I'm just gonna like stab myself in the heart right now. And I'm really excited when I come across people or historic individuals that have kind of like a transcendent end. Um, and Sarah Parker Riemann does have a transcendent end. I mean, she ended up practicing um, medicine in Italy and getting married to a Sicilian and you know, like living the rest of her life free, basically. Um, and outside of, I mean, for the most part, more or less, I don't know, but outside of US racial politics. Um, I'm kind of interested in those figures just because they circulate outside of that and provide just a different way of thinking about um, black lives in America, I guess. Ten minutes. Want to take five? <laughs>